Hi, I'm Jonathan Skinner, and I teach and research environmental humanities in the Department of English and Comparative Literary Studies at the University of Warwick. My particular focus within the environmental humanities is poetry and poetics, with an emphasis on what has come to be called eco-poetics, the writing and study of poetry in environmental contexts, especially one that moves from a practice and critique of nature poetry toward an expanded sense of the serious play and work poetry can do in a time of environmental crisis, increasingly defined by, though not limited to, climate breakdown. Climate breakdown is often referred to in terms of the Anthropocene, a new formal unit of geological epoch divisions under consideration with the Stratigraphy Commission of the Geological Society of London, meant to indicate a geological epoch during which human activity has become the dominant influence on climate and the environment. One notable effect of the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown, which came to be called the Great Pause, was a reduction in circulation, in air traffic, as well as in the movement of automobiles, buses, and trains, amongst other forms of transport. This led to an 18% reduction in global carbon emissions over the same period in the previous year. Given the grave economic impact of the lockdown, this figure is in fact soberingly small. In light of the 45% reduction in carbon emissions by 2030 required to stabilize global warming at an acceptable 1.5 degrees Celsius, according to a 2018 report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It may be that the psychological and cultural impact of our great pause will be more important to the challenging times ahead than the dent in atmospheric emissions. A turn in my research to the work of Canadian poet Peter Culley, with its node to the long English tradition of walking poetry, made sense during lockdown, as I composed an essay on Culley's loco descriptive poetry and followed Culley's example in setting out on foot to explore the environs of my own neighborhood. As a corollary, perhaps, to the reduction in circulation, one silver lining in lockdown has been the widely noted phenomenon of residents getting to know their neighborhoods like never before, and paying attention to seasonal changes during what, in England at least, was a spectacular spring. Many visited their local woodlands, noting birdsong and other natural sounds, newly vibrant in the absence of the usual din of traffic. One sound that unfortunately did not abate was the din of diggers, shovels, and chainsaws, as contractors proceeded with the enabling works deemed essential by the Tory government for the HS2 high-speed rail line, which cuts through ancient woodland just adjacent to University of Warwick land. This massive infrastructure project, which will not under the rosiest business projections be carbon neutral for 100 years, is being undertaken on the basis of a highly contested rationale, one that became even more tenuous as companies and employees discovered during lockdown the feasibility and benefits of working remotely, an arrangement that surely is here to stay for a large portion of the sector. Unlike plantations, whose root systems might date back one or two hundred years, ancient woodlands shelter subterranean ecosystems that date back centuries, if not millennia. The complex interactions and rhizomic networks of these ecosystems support myriad species and phenomena, including the spectacular spring native bluebell displays, whose mysterious germination gardeners have never been able to cultivate without resorting to imported Spanish bluebells. One of the best local displays can be encountered each April right on the University of Warwick campus in Tossel Woods. In the face of this construction, groups of brave tree protectors set up encampments in the woodlands. I'll now read a poem of my own entitled Paragraphs on Forest Bathing. I wrote the poem for the encampment at nearby Covington Woods, an ancient woodland recorded in the 11th century Domesday Book, sadly to be felled as it stands in the path of the HS2 line. I conceived this prose poem as a bit of instructional literature in the guise of a poem or vice versa, to articulate the health benefits, both physical and psychological, that woodlands bring, drawing on the Japanese practice of forest bathing, or shinrin-yoku. Each stanza, or paragraph, of this poem is accompanied by a photograph of a tree, one of dozens of tree portraits I have made in walks local, around Great Britain, on the European continent, and across North America, 
over the better part of the last decade. Paragraphs on Forest Bathing, Shinrin Yoku. If you live near an old growth forest or even a bit of ancient woodland, you are in luck. But if not, you can still enjoy forest bathing. Find a small stand of trees in a park, one large tree, or the shade in your backyard. Forest bathing is immersive, but no need to travel to the Amazon or Redwoods or a national park. Every forest, grove, or roadside tree exceeds the space of your mind and heart. Scale and open yourself to the forest, whatever its size. If you have just one tree to bathe with, lie down, place your head between its roots, and look up. These branches are a forest. We rarely experience trees. They surround us, silenced, the furniture of our days. Perhaps we move too quickly. In forest bathing, we slow down to meet the grove. Forest bathing begins with acknowledgement. The forest has an outside, and we go to the forest to lose ourselves on the inside. It is easy to cross a forest today without noticing. Observe the forest as you approach. Pause at the threshold to notice the forest edge. Close your eyes a moment and listen. Announcing yourself silently, await the forest's invitation. At the forest edge, a contrast between light and dark blinds your senses. Notice this transition. When you have adjusted, recall the other side. How long did you walk to find this tree with more branches than you can count? How far away is hot pavement with no shade, barren winter, desert, or open sea, the overlit surface of the moon? You carry two forests inside of you, one inside each of your lungs. All life breathes with the lungs of the forest, and it is through breathing that you make contact with the forest. Without breath, there is no forest bathing. Breathe naturally and attentively, noticing your breath as it bathes in the many breathings of the forest, finding its rhythm amidst the movements of branches and leaves. Life is too short to know all there is to know about trees, but forest bathing does not require forest knowledge. While tree study may develop your perception, and while you greet the forest sense by sense, as you relax more deeply into the forest, you do not need to know the names. It is with the heart that you will perceive the trees. You can't bicycle through a forest, except perhaps very slowly. Try walking more slowly than you ever thought possible. But don't force things. Just notice how many steps for every breath you take. The first thing to ask is not, what tree is this, but how do I feel? As you move more deeply into the forest, you experience the forest through your feelings, even as the forest helps you forget them. Most trees like to be touched. You don't need to hug the beech, the ash, or redwood, as if you could. Place your hand on the bark and let its fingers interlace yours. If it is smooth, touch the bark the way you might touch a lover's skin. Is it warm, cool? Don't expect to feel a beating heart. Just share some time with the tree. If you can lay your head where the trunk goes into the ground, look up through the branches and leaves into the forest canopy. Focus on the topmost leaf that you can see, then relax your gaze to take in all the leaves. Let your eyes swim in all the moving spaces between the branches. Can you feel the light and shade on your skin? You might hear sounds from beyond the forest edge, a church bell, shouting, a football match, parent calling child, farm machinery, a dog barking. Focus on one sound, then relax to take in all the sounds, including the voices of the leaves. Listen as every leaf twists its dial on the air, making forest airs. Let the forest airs play on your sense of smell, even just the tang of a few aspen leaves, the breath of one tree. What you find by plunging your nose into warm ponderosa scales might surprise you. Others won't let you in so close. The scent of the flowering lime must be shared from afar. In New England forests, look for wintergreen, small leaves whose crunch is the definition of spearmint. 
It can't hurt to take just a pinch between your teeth, to taste with the tip of your tongue. Low, creeping brambles present tangy fruit, free from farmer's spray or territorial mark. If you spot fungi, bring one to your nose. It's okay to break off a bit. The mushroom is just the fruit of the mycelial tree. Don't let browsing distract from bathing. You're just eating off the branch, not filling a basket. Take off your shoes and let the earth between your toes, feeling its temperature, the tickle of leaves on the forest floor. It won't be long before you notice you're not alone in the forest. In forest bathing, one experiences bird song as forest airs. Leave binoculars, field recorder, and camera at home. You probably won't see birds anyways, just a fleck of color, a commotion in the leaves, unending flits between branch ends. You might feel their shadows on your closed eyelids, or shadows of leaves in the canopy. Their bewitching song sounds a quiet forest as a choir opens its spaces or embroiders the surf of wind and leaves with half-heard notes. The monody of night-singing birds, indistinguishable from trilling frogs, can still the most agitated heart. In the forest, birds take wing as trees take leaves. That bird could be a squirrel extending the arc of a branch, a buck startling at your scent, the distant bark of a fox, the floss of a porcupine snack landing on your head, one thing becomes another. The forest won't leave you alone. There might be mosquitoes or biting flies, nettles, thorns, and poison ivy. Spiders are more likely to bite in your home. But ticks are a real concern. If you forest bathe in tick country in early spring, you need to protect yourself. Don't mess around with a tick. Educate yourself, learn the symptoms, but don't get paranoid. Forest bathing is not about getting clean. It is good to bathe alone, but in communal forest bathing, individual pleasures wash away into something that is more than the ease of each participant. As you move together through the forest, don't be surprised to find yourselves communicating without words. Those voices you hear are the thoughts of the trees.